G'day guys and welcome back to the Back Pocket Plug Up Podcast. My name is Cade McDonald and I'm joined by my co-host Connor Rogers. Roggy, how are you travelling mate? Yes, once again, um, I feel like it's unavoidable not to mention that we are still locked inside <laughs> under house arrest. But once again, like I say every week, as devastating and crippling as that may be for many, at least we have the footy, finals footy, and every round of finals has been producing big game matches, and it's given us absolutely plenty to talk about at McDonald, and I can't wait to get into it. How are you? Oh, I'm travelling okay. Yeah, travelling all right. Nerves are really starting to bubble away under the surface now. Um, obviously, I had the week off being a Melbourne supporter, so we got to cruise through the semi-finals. But now that it's prelim final week, it's finally upon us. Uh, the nerves are starting to bubble away, but it's exciting. How how, uh, how do you feel about the week off? Do you would you rather see a situation where the Ds don't have to take a week off and you can just keep that momentum into another prelim the week after? Or do you like the thought of getting a week's rest? The other teams have played. They've gone to war this weekend, um, so you might have the edge on them. Or do you think that it might, you know... Slow you down a bit, losing that momentum. Uh, I love the week off, to be honest. I needed <laughs> the ticker. The old heart uh, needed a week off watching this team. Um, but, no, I, I do I do like it, especially because the pre-finals buy got taken away. Um, yeah. If it had been one of those things where the pre-finals buy was still there and then we play one game, then we have another buy, I think that can be a little bit disruptive. But I think... Uh, yeah, it, it's actually given a little bit of reward to the teams that won that first qualifying final. So I like the week off. Yep, me too. And I wish my team was in that position, but <laughs> I'm all aboard the D's van wagon. Uh, we'll fire into the headline, Rog, after a gripping couple of semi finals. What have we got on Dawson Rog Limited? There's no big pun here. There's no massive play on words. It's just call it as you see it. And the headline reads, ice in his veins. I love that man. I love that (laughs) celebration. I hate him. I hate him with every (laughs) ounce of my body. I'm so jealous of him. It's like he's living the life I would love to live. But um, when I take the jealousy away, when I strip it back and I just see this bloke who has so much heart and so much ticker, gut running, uh, kick the sealer or kick the goal. And with still a few minutes to play, call the ice in his vein celebration. I thought it was gutsy. <laughs> Some would call it silly, but I love that game of football and I love that finish. Yes, Bailey Smith, unbelievable in the dying seconds of the semi final against the Lions. I was on Skype with Mitter watching it along. We timed our KOs up and had a bit of a Skype as we watched, and Mitter was sort of going, Geez, that was a great celebration, but there's enough time for it to look really silly. And it almost did. Zach Bailey kicked a late one. Scores were tied. Um, and then, obviously, Latham Vandermeer with the point that saw the dogs get up. I can't believe the dogs. I thought, and it's probably a bit silly. It's probably a bit football media of me to have been sucked into the dogs' uh, poor form. But I, I thought there's no chance they make a prelim after their sort of form that... W- they ended the season on. But now that they're in the prelim, I go, well, they were obviously going to make it. They were one of the best sides all year. (laughs) Well, I tipped them to um, beat the Bombers comfortably. I thought I was going to be done as it was. And then um, came to this week, and I don't know if anyone at home has been following my little tipping updates. I don't know if anyone cares, but I'll provide the update regardless. (laughs) Went into the round with scores level, and uh, Vivian, the other lass who's on top, went, uh, w- I knew that she was going uh, the Lions and I thought this is going to be my one chance. I either settle for um, us going even the whole way through because I know next week both people are going to tip Melbourne and Port and I know in the grand final everyone's going to tip Melbourne. So I thought this is my one chance to go outright, balls out, win it all for myself <laughs> and I tipped the doggies. They got up by a point and now that they're in the prelim, I'm looking up against them against Port, and I'm sorry, Port supporters, because we've ravaged your (laughs) autumn season. You couldn't have been any more convincing this final series. You're into the prelim, and you should be a red-hot fancy for a flag. And I'm here going, I think the doggies might get up. Imagine that. Imagine that. They should have been – they were almost the minor premiers. They had the minor premiership sewn up with a couple of rounds to go, the doggies. They fell – not just short, they didn't finish second, third or fourth. They fell completely out of the top four, which usually rules you out of contention. But if there was, and I know this is a bit of a cliche, but if there was ever a side to do it from outside the top four, it's the doggies that you wouldn't be counting out, even though I absolutely did. Um, 
Yeah, it's it's an unbelievable effort. And as you said, I think I said last week, I think I said last week, um, out of that side of the bracket, I still feel like a dogs or a lions worry me more than a port. And now that uh, the, the dogs have gotten through to the prelim, I think I will be less confident if, say, the D's touch wood, you know, fingers crossed, uh, progress through this week. Say a dog's get up. I think I'll be quite nervous. <laughs> I think because yeah. the way they played us earlier in the year was very, very good. They got up by a couple of goals. So um, it's just amazing how a two, three-week swing can just change your form completely. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Uh, and I, I think uh, the doggies are starting to win a lot of people over. I think when they uh, Joshy Bruce went down and uh, it was just starting to look <laughs> like the wheels would fallen off completely, but a couple of big finals wins. And, and with that belief of already having won a premiership from outside the eight, yeah. you, see Luke, you see Luke Beveridge and his steely look, and you just feel like they have that belief in them to take the next step. Whereas with Port Adelaide, I don't I think I don't get me wrong, I'm sure they're believing and I'm sure they're all convinced they're gonna make a grand final. But it wouldn't surprise me if when we go to we fast forward a few days and we're watching this game live, it wouldn't surprise me if you see Port be that little bit more hesitant with the nerves of the chance of making a grand final and you see the Bulldogs thrive under the pressure because they've done it before. Well it's quite funny because uh, when the D's and Port Adelaide won pretty convincingly in that those qualifying finals. Straight away, that sort of uh, rhetoric around who you know is favourite for the flag went straight to those two teams. But the games that are being played in the prelim coming up are the same games that were played in round twenty three. And those round twenty three games, I think Port won by three points and the D's won by one or two. Yeah. Um, and it was a kick after the siren. So. It's quite funny that a week ago, everyone's like, oh, well, the D's in the power are box seat <laughs> premiership favourites. And now you're going into these games, and I think Damien Barrett wrote an article on it for AFL.com, but going into these games, he said, these prelims are a 50-50. They're, they're a flip of the coin. And I, I genuinely are. agree. I think they are. And what, um, what I think about, and I know this is probably the gambler's brain, but um, you know, it seems like the Demons should win, and it seems like... Port Adelaide should win. They're both the dollar fifty favourites, um, but when you when you put them both into a two leg multi, it starts paying like two dollars twenty. And when it's over two dollars, that means that it's not you know it's, it's not exactly a, a certainty. Yep. You know, it's uh, <laughs> unlikely if you will, or not a massive chance. So even though you think Demons and Port on face value have been the best two sides all year, they should just romp at home against the Cats and the Dogs. Uh, it is a prelim final, and prelim finals are harder to win than grand finals, they all say. Mm. So um, I'm expecting two ripping contests. But back onto the Dogs and the Lions game, um, it's hard not to talk about the Doggies without talking about their engine room because, um, you know, you won't see many better. McRae did McRae things. Bailey Smith was probably best on ground with three goals. Um, but what's happened? What's the go with old Adzo Trelaw McDonald? A quiet, yeah, yeah, a little bit of a quiet one. Um, I'm not sure he's returned uh, for a quiet month. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'm not sure whether he's returned from his injury um, as well as he would have liked. I'm still not sure. Maybe it's a synergy thing. He did uh, miss a lot of football. Um, so, yeah, and it's quite funny because a lot of uh, the the talk around the media is. They jump straight away. They jump straight away. I've seen the the talk around did Collingwood lose that much, um, considering Trelaw's form, which I think is a little bit premature, and I think it's probably just some of the Pies supporters uh, <laughs> trying to get one back. But um, it, it's good though to see that the Bulldogs are performing even without a Trelaw. We know their engine room bats deep, um, but it's going to be interesting whether he can turn it on, especially in the next game or two. Yeah, and. It, apparently, there is an attitudinal uh, possible uh, error in judgment on his part, an ad- attitudinal attitudinal problem with regards Jeez, to with regards to uh, him sitting on a forward flank instead of yeah. in the midfield. He he thinks that he was recruited there to be a, a midfield explosive player, and it's hard to explode out explode out of packs when you're at the footballer's graveyard, which is the forward <laughs> flank. <laughs> yeah, well, that that is one hundred percent correct, and uh, we have seen you know before midfielders get tossed around in different areas, and they don't 
quite have the same output. And I do see Adam Trelaw as that pure midfielder. Um, and it's just crazy because, like, going to any side that um, you could have picked to be traded to, the Western Bulldogs were certainly not short a midfielder, and especially when all the talk around uh, Josh Dunkley leaving, um, like there was a lot of talks that they might get rid of Josh Dunkley, which sort of made sense because then Adam Trelaw comes in and there is a midfield spot, but he he, he stayed as well, so it it wasn't like, yeah, it, 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 for the f- and I feel like um, as much as we think Trelaw, you know, he's just a pure midfielder, you can't take McRae out of there, you no. can't take Lib- you can't take Liber out of there. Um, Mont rotates a little bit. Yeah, Bond rotates a little bit, so I suppose that's where the Trelaw rotation comes in. But you 100% cannot take McRae and Liberatore out of there. How good is Libba? Yeah. I just love, like, everything about Libba, he's that tough, just refuses to give in on a contest, always wins for 50-50s, and kicks goals as well. And he's just a character. I I think Libba should be, all this talk is that Bailey Smith is the new face (laughs) of the New face for the AFL. I think Tom Liberatore should be a bit of a shout there. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Lions? Uh, they, they did really well to fight their way into the top four. They didn't really seem like a top four side all year. Maybe that's a little bit harsh to say uh, with that 2020 hindsight, now that we've seen them go out in straight sets, and that's probably a little bit too critical. But most of the year, they were sort of floundering between that sixth and fourth sort of zone. Uh, credit to them. They, they made it to the top four. They've done that three years in a row now, which is tough to do by any stretch of the imagination. So I think we should give the Lions credit there. But uh, Chris Fagan is one and four from his uh, finals campaigns. Um, well, his final games. He's, he's won one and four. And it's, it's a little bit disappointing. How did you see the Lions sort of last couple of weeks? Yeah, unfortunately, and I hope I'm wrong because I like the Lions. I love their players and I love Fags, but I feel like they scream sort of that mid 2000s Bulldogs team that just kept on making prelims but weren't quite good enough to crack the grand final. Um, I hope I'm wrong, but it just, I, I'm not sure if I'm seeing premiers written on their list, especially when we're talking uh, Lockie Neal might be on the outer. And this is a bloke who's been there three years, won two All Australians two best and fairest, and a uh, and a Brownlow medal. Um, so you take that out, him out of the mix as well, and I think it gets even harder. So uh, I have a few question marks over big Joe Danaher as well, and I know a lot of people are saying that, and I'm not the first to say it, but I just don't know if he's a man that, um, if he's that big, bullocking, full forward, sort of centre-half forward type that gets you to a grand final or wins you a premiership. Yeah, and it's it's... It's tough because they weren't a destination club for a long time and uh, they sort of did change that narrative a little bit by getting the Lockie Neal. I think he was probably the breakthrough recruit and then Joe Danaher came up and uh, it was great to get Cam Atlas Yolman as well. (laughs) But uh, Joe Danaher hasn't quite performed to the level, um, especially in the finals. He was pretty handy throughout the year. but Yeah, he kicked a goal in every game during the season. But yeah, I just don't know if he's if his type of football play, he can bob up in one game and look like the next Buddy Franklin. But when he's having off days, which happens a bit, it just doesn't scream like uh, he doesn't fill you with confidence. I think. Yeah, and, and I feel like you need him. Well, you're gonna need, like that. The weight that was put on him, especially with Hitwood going out, was massive, and I'm not sure he um, played. Yeah, as well without that extra tall running around in the forward line with him. But that extra weight on him now going into next season and maybe a Lockie Neal dropping out, it's going to be an interesting year for the Lions, whether they can go one better than this year or whether they sort of just flounder in that middle of the top eight sort of zone. Yeah, well, if from anyone in the top four at the moment, if you had to pick a, one of them that's sort of going to... Uh, peter out it's probably the catters just because of their age bracket um and the lions i think will still be there in the top four next year i think they've still got um a few gears to go to but yeah my gut feel unfortunately says that um they they won't break through that glass ceiling of a premiership. They just, they lack something. I don't know. I don't quite know what it is. They have had a few injuries this year. I reckon a Cam Rain is going to be super important to get back. He'll be massive. He, he is that X factor. But um, 
Yeah, it's a bit of a watch on the Lions because their age demographic and now their experience, they've made three top four finishes. Um, they, they've got those games under the belt. They are still quite a young side. So I feel like uh, there's probably more optimism than pessimism about them going forward. But there are just a couple of question marks question starting marks. to form. Yeah, for sure. Is Mitch Robinson going around another year? He is, yep. Because I just am desperate to see him run around a grand final. I think there is a genuine chance he might kill someone <laughs> in there. Like, yes. Just full kamikaze mode, throwing his body in. I reckon it'd be an absolute sight to behold Mitch Robinson in a, in a big dance. And next year as well, he could full, full go Alistair Lynch mode, considering it'll probably be his <laughs> last season. He would just go absolutely bananas. Yes, you know, Mitchy, Mitchy Rob, Rob Vlogs would be unbelievable uh, in what, the big uh, pressure games. What have you made of the Lockie Neal trade? Um, well, he's, go- he's going. He's going. Well, he, ca- he came out today and there was a bit of a statement from the club and it was, yeah, we chatted to him. He hasn't f- formally requested a trade, wants a little bit of time to uh, just assess his options. That just screams he's going to me. And that was such a weird statement to bring out because it was sort of a statement going – don't listen to everything you've heard. But then it also sort of confirmed that it's probably going to happen. <laughs> yeah. If if it comes out and it's anything but he's staying, he's in their rumours, if it's anything but that, you know that he's probably going. Uh, and I don't have an issue. You know, players want to leave, bugger it. I, 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 I used to love loyalty and I used to – that's what I was all about. Now it's gotten to a point in the AFL and pretty much sport globally where you just have to accept that it is sort of a business and that – these old days of just being a one colour player forever, they're not really, you know, relevant anymore. Yeah. Um, but where I do sit a little bit uncomfortably <laughs> with this decision is if the rumours are true, which they appear to be, that it's a heavily front-ended contract that he signed over at, uh, at the Lions. You know, let's just... And I'm making up the numbers here. Believe it or not, I don't know his contract status. <laughs> but say uh, he's a 750k a year player and um, they front-ended the contract just to make everyone fit. So he's getting a million dollars a year for his first three years. And then coming up in the next three years or two years where it was meant to be on the 500K, he's he's taken his, he's got his million for two or three years. He's mm. taken his bat and ball and he's gone back to Frio where he'll likely be paid that 800K mark or whatever it is. And he's just scored an extra five 600K out of nothing. Now, I'm making the numbers up and I don't even know if it's completely true that – he, uh, that he was on a front-end contract. But that's what all the conversation is about. And if it is true, something tells me that that seems illegal. <laughs> front-ended contracts are so dodgy, it's not even funny. <laughs> it's so, it's so, like, oh, why can't, it's it's manipulating of, like, the salary cap almost. Um, and Yeah, well, Carlton's done it, and, and I've loved the way Carlton's done it. Like, we've it's priced people... We've priced people out of the game by putting a high price tag on Jack Barton for the first year and no one wants to match a million, so then we can just pay him 200K for his next few years. You know, doing that sort of stuff, I think it's real clever. But, Mm. yeah, from the player's perspective, I don't know if you can agree to a front-end contract and request to trade out before the... you know, when it gets to the back end, that is surely it should be written in the clause where if you do (laughs) that, you need to pay some of it back or something something of the like. Yeah, well, it is going to be interesting. He he wants to, um, his wife wants like they're weighing up living in WA because I think his wife is from WA, and it's quite funny because everyone's like all the Frio supporters are getting so excited that you know Lockie Neal's coming back. Wouldn't it just be the ultimate kick in the teeth if he went to West Coast? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would be hilarious. I think it works well for Carlton with the Cheddar trade where. Um, Obviously, considering Neil went to Brisbane at the cost of two first-round draft picks, basically, yep. um, now that he's – I know he's a couple of years older, he's 28, but he's still, you know, basically in prime years. Mm. Um, so in those uh, – they gave up two first-round draft picks and Neil has since won two best and fairest, two All-Australians and a Brownlow. I don't think you can ask for anything less than two first-round draft picks. I think that has to be the – the return price, considering he still has two years left on his contract. Yep. So Freo are going to need to find um, two first rounders for somewhere. I'm not sure if they have one, but I know that Chera wants out and we have pick six. So I think the cards are in Carlton's hands. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. Um, yes. Yeah, well, so it- well, because they could have said 
you know, before this was happening, we want pick six, Petrescu, Seaton, and mm. a second rounder, and we might have had to go, all right, fine, well, you've got the chips because you've got Chera and we want Chera. Yeah. But now it's sort of like, well, we know you just need pick six to get the meal <laughs> yeah. trade done. That's all you're getting. <laughs> yeah. Nah, for sure. Um, that will be a watch and a half, the Lockie Neal trade. It's, it, there's there's always one or two that bob up uh, in the off-season that catch you by uh, surprise. But this is probably one of the more surprising ones, given how happy he was at Brisbane and how he only just got up there. So, uh, really yeah, interesting. Yeah, well, the, the when I first heard it, and, you know, we've talked about this a bit when you think of the best midfielders in the game and instantly your head goes to your Martins and your Fifes and, and Pendlebury's and this type. Yep. And then now we've got... Clayton Oliver coming through and Petrarca and these types and your Ollie Wineses. Um, but, you know, those three that I mentioned before this year, you never would have said, you know, best midfielders in the league, bang, Clayton Oliver. It's just happened this year, they've gone bang. Uh, Lockie Neal's one where he's won a Brown, though. Mm. Um, he's won all Australian honours, multiple occasions. But uh, when I heard Lockie Neal's requested a trade back to Fremantle, it didn't hit me quite as hard as. Clayton Oliver's re- requested a trade away from the Demons. Yeah. It didn't hit me quite as hard as anything like that. But when you take a step back and look at it, this is like in their prime when the Lions are in their premiership tilt. They've made two top four finishes in a row. This is when they're, they're – next year they should be winning the grand final. And their Brownlow medalist, two-time best and fairest win the last two years, is requesting a trade out. It is as big as it gets <laughs> when it comes to requesting a trade out. It is – catastrophic for the Lions. Yeah, it is. It is really massive, really surprising. And, um, yeah, it's going to be exciting to watch. Oh, I'm usually really into the uh, the trade period by now, but because the days are still live in the footy, it's like a bit of a weird distraction, a bit of a weird afterthought. Like all these news articles are popping up about who could go where, and I'm going, it's a bit <laughs> premature, guys. The footy's still just, on. Just get me to the last weekend of September, please, <laughs> before we start talking about this stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know how my football club is supposed to entice anyone to the club before we even have a bloody coach, and it seems like seems like no one wants to sit in the chair. Uh, it seem, seems like anyone we're requesting to trade over will be presenting them with a captain coach role, but... Uh, <laughs> Speaking of Lockie Neal, gun midfielders from uh, uh, the Sunshine State. Mm. I just wanted to take a minute to just show my appreciation. I already have a few times this year for my boy, Took Miller. Uh, the hardest working midfielder in the game. Uh, and he's come out during the week. He's won the Gold Coast Best and Fairest. And all the conversation whenever you talk about Gold Coast is how are they going to retain these players? Why would they want to play for this sort of shambles of a football club when they could go play in front of 80,000 every week at one of the big Vic teams. And Took Miller's come out this week. He's won the best and fairest. And he said, I love this club so much. It's a joke. I'm not going anywhere. No, we uh, love that. We love that. And that's what you build a team around. That's when the next breed of Gold Coast players look at Took Miller, an All-Australian, maybe a chance of winning a Brown though if he wasn't suspended. And he's saying that. Mm. I think that's what... Yeah, you know, that's what the football club will be built on going forward. The next 12 months, I think we've said this before, the next 12 months for the Gold Coast Suns is really, really critical. Uh, they really need to rise up the ladder. They need to double down on that culture. And someone like Took Miller could be that bloke who sticks around. Obviously, he's going to stick around. Sticks around and helps just bring that stability to the place. And I think... Uh, what, they had that massive clean out 2018 or end of 2018 and it's been a couple of years since then. There's a little bit of stability sort of off field it seems. Um, you know, p- players aren't just walking out the door at the minute. So they've had two or three years with that those couple of drafts. Um, they've got people like Took Miller who are sticking around and showing great passion for the club. So I think these next 12 months are going to be really, really telling um, for the Gold Coast Suns and hopefully it goes in the right direction because... I love the footy when it's um, up and about up there. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Uh, but enough about the bloody Gold Coast. The Cats and Giants fans will be sitting there going, we've just played in a bloody final. <laughs> Can you please talk about us? Forget about that rabble up at Queensland. <laughs> uh, but in saying that, it wasn't the most exciting final you've ever watched. Uh, <laughs> I think halfway through the second quarter, I started to nod off, if I'm being completely honest. I was laying on the couch and I struggled. But we got through it and it ended up being a decent old contest. What do you make of the Cats and the Giants, McDonald? Uh, it was sort of everything we thought it would be. Geelong uh, known for uh, dipping out in the first final, but then making a really strong comeback in the second final. 
before ultimately. What do you reckon that is? Is that a psychological thing? Is it a tactical thing? How can they be so? And it's it's you know it's not a uh, coincidence anymore. It's a trend. It's not. It's a, a body of work. It's a body of work. How can they be so insipid in the first final and so uh, so convincing in the second? It doesn't make any sense. I, I I don't know what I could put it down to. There was there used to be a pre-finals buy, and Geelong were sort of weirdly notorious for being slow after a bye week. So maybe that was it a couple of years ago, but there was none this year. Um, I, I couldn't tell you. It really doesn't make much sense. Some of the Fox footy stuff that I was watching, your David Kings uh, and the like, were saying that maybe their brand of football is really good for home and away. It's great for home and away. It gets you the, the Ws. It gets you into the top four, but it's not. it doesn't have that DNA to stand up in big pressure finals. Now, I'm not sure I'm convinced <laughs> enough to say that considering they made the grand final and they make prelims for fun. It's just – it is a little bit of an interesting – Interesting little watch, but uh, they were always going to bounce back. And they did so very, very convincingly sort of after three-quarter time. The first three quarters were pretty bang average, if I'm going to be honest. Um, and the Giants were sort of brave. They, they were undermanned. It was a, a kneeful side running around. But they were they – just, they just didn't have the class to get it done against the Cats. The Cats are a very accurate team, and they'll, they'll punish you um, if you're not perfect. So – uh, the Giants were brave. Hats off to them for having a bit of a dip, but they were really no chance from word go, to be honest. <laughs> nah, they weren't. And especially when, obviously, you know, Toby Green went out. Did they have another laid out before the game? Uh, Jesse Hogan and then Tom yeah, Green didn't get up after when, the yeah, weekend. When, I mean, they were up against it as it is, and when you're losing that sort of talent, it's always going to be difficult. When you when Chris Scott retires, let's just say you know he goes another couple of years and it follows a similar trend. Let's assume he doesn't win another premiership. He'll retire with the greatest winning win loss record in AFL history, I believe. I think he currently has that. Mm-hmm. Where do you think you know he sits? Will he be regarded as one of the all time great coaches, or do you think the fact that he won a premiership in his first year and despite making the top four? in all but one of his following however many seasons or whatever the statistic is, uh, do you think it'll really hurt his reputation that he wasn't able to capitalise and win another premiership? Jeez, it's so harsh, isn't it, if that was the way people think of him. I know that premierships are the ultimate success, but they played in 11, 11 of the last 15 prelims. Like It is just yeah. absurd the sustained success that the Cats have had. And obviously living in Geelong, I've been front and centre to the whole thing and it's it's so impressive it's so impressive each year the way they do it and the way they just consistently get it done and when they don't have good years they still finish in the top eight it's just it is so impressive uh will it sort of uh damage his his reputation uh, i don't think so i don't think so because there's so many great afl players out there that don't have a premiership and they're um their, their careers are still looked at very impressively. And there's so many great coaches who have made prelim after prelim or uh, lost grand finals, like a, a Ross Lyon. And he's looked at as like one of the great coaches that we've seen in the modern era. And he hasn't got a flag. So I think it sours it a tiny bit, but I don't think it really affects uh, the way everyone looks at Chris Scott because he has been an amazing coach. I couldn't agree more because you look at – because Geelong have just constantly made finals, it – you t- they take it for granted. People mm. take that for granted with Geelong. They think they're just meant to be in the top four and uh, they should win a premiership every now and then. But they're just a football club like anyone else. You know, I, I obviously, m- my head goes straight to my own football club and I think about how we've made, you know, 23 years I've been watching, we've made the finals a couple of times, maybe won the first final and we're straight out and we haven't made the top four. Yeah. For them to make the top four as much as they have, you know, I know, like you said, it is about premierships, but Jesus, to be that consistently making the top four, that is success. They make it look um, seamless. So do, it's quite they. funny, like the D's made uh, the top four and a prelim this year. And it honestly, for every Melbourne supporter out there who knows how hard it is, it feels like we've clawed tooth and nail for every victory to get to the top four. And then it feels like we clawed tooth and nail through the Lions game, even though some people might say it looked uh, like we were comfortable. It's just that nerves and that nervous energy. And because we've never been here before, the stress of like, oh, we finally made it to a prelim. It feels like a big thing. This Geelong team go out 
and do it like it's a training drill. They make prelims and top four finishes so consistently. It is a little bit absurd. So um, it, it, it's a credit to them. And it's why going into this week, all Melbourne supporters, and me in particular, are so nervous because this side, it, it you don't accidentally be this good over this amount of t- uh, time. So I feel like the Ds have almost their backs against the wall, up against the wall, to try and take down these Cats this week. Yeah, you know what, going, and we're going to get to our Melbourne Cats preview shortly, but looking <laughs> at that game, um, I my gut and heart has told me the whole way through the Demons win. They just win. But the more I think about the Cats' sustained success and I think <laughs> about Joel Selwood, I think about what Joel Selwood does, how he's just – he. He's made a living off dragging teams <laughs> over the line when he need when they need it, and I I don't think I've ever seen a player like Joel Selwood, maybe Luke Hodge, mm. but just the player who single handedly just by a couple of acts, repeated acts, can drag a team into success. Yep. Oh, it's going to be one hell of a game, but I still do stand by the D's. But going back to the Cats and Giants game, I think we'd be remiss not to mention the exploits of Tom Hawkins at. He is in the elite of the elite of the elite category for mine now. Like, when you're talking, certainly best key forwards of the generation, but when you're talking the great key forwards and you go Franklin and you go Pavlich of modern times, um, uh, I think you've got to be going Tom Hawkins now. He he's, he, get, he gets better the older he goes on, and uh, he seems unstoppable at times. He does. At the minute, his strength is crazy. He is the the prime example of never writing off an AFL footballer. He was very much scrutinised for his early parts of his career and it sort of went a long time. It, it went from... I remember that. It went ages. It went It went almost like a 10-year sort of period where he became just a good forward. So he went yeah. from being scrutinised for the first six years of his career and then he turned into a good forward. And yeah. now over the last like five or six years, he's been... He's been elite. He's been the best forward. He has been the best yeah. forward for like a five or six year period, um, and the best, the most reliable, the best set shot, the, the strongest, the, well, the best set shot. He's set shot kicking is a thing of beauty. The strongest, absolutely. So um, he's absolutely earned his flowers that he's getting at the moment. Tom Hawkins and uh, and the smartest, like the way well, it is he, the most selfless as well. Like not he, yeah. he could have double the goals, but he handballs and gives them off more than anyone else. Yeah, like when I, the way I see Tom Hawkins body people under the ball, it literally seems unstoppable. It's one of the, mm. you know, it, I remember watching Gary Ablett Jr. in his prime, um, the way he just run around, collect 45 touches and hit targets and kick three goals. And you felt like this is unfair. You can't stop this bloke. I, this, it's wrong that they get to have Gary Ablett and we have to play against them <laughs> yeah. and we don't get Gary Ablett Jr. <laughs> yeah. And when, when you're watching Tom Hawkins, it's like, this is why have we got a why have you got a bloke at full forward that literally cannot be moved? Like he just put it anywhere in his vicinity and he's gonna outmuscle you and he's gonna go back and kick the goal because he's a straight set shot. It feels like someone's put a cheat card on Tom Hawkins. Mm, yeah. He's done a cheat code like a video game. Yeah. He's just taken the absolute PI double five. Hundred percent. And um it's just crazy because it's like, oh yeah, Geelong it's not like we look at Geelong and go, Oh, they got Tom Hawkins, but who else have they got? Oh, they got Tom yeah. Hawkins and Jeremy Cameron. Jeremy Cameron. And, uh, <laughs> Gary Rowan. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. Um, Their team is stacked. They make prelims and grand finals for fun, and then they double down by having the best trade periods. It's it's genuinely absurd what they've done over the last little bit, um, and they're right in it. They're right in it again, and it's a credit to them. On the – almost the reverse, Tom Hawkins, you know, when we're talking uh, uh, much maligned footballer turned into superstar late – if we're talking superstar early turned into much maligned, we're talking <laughs> Steve Canelio. Uh, can anyone tell me what the hell has happened there? And and can I, the one thing that has gone right for my shambles of a football club in my two decades of existence is we did not end up paying Canelio a million dollars a year over five or six years or whatever the hell we were going to do. Uh, is there any players that have had real patches in their career where they go missing but then come good again because I'm I'm anticipating Patrick Cripps to get back to his career best form and I don't think his last couple of seasons will sort of sour his uh, resume when his career is done and I, I do have the faith that Cornelio can do it as well. I, maybe an Ollie Wines. I remember Ollie Wines came onto the... Uh, on. I don't think Ollie Wines went 
um, you know, was massively maligned. I think he plateaued. Plateaued. Because he started really, really well, Ollie Wines. And then... Yeah, he was like the bull out the gate and you thought this guy could be anything. And then he just went into a good footballer. Yeah, good call. But I don't think he was... What, like, Cornelio's dropped. He's, people are like, what the hell are we going to do with Cornelio? But is there, yeah, um, is there anyone who's sort of gone missing for a two, three-year patch and then come back and played well, career best I mean, footy? There, 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 would players, be, there would be players early, but I don't know how many players there would be in their prime. Because well, Cornelio's late 20s now. Mm. Um, so I don't know how many people get to his getting dropped the way he has and coming back to being a superstar captain of an AFL team. Yep. Um, you know, obviously you have young players like Jacob Wiedering who gets dropped and you think, gee, is he ever going to make the grade? And then he comes back and he's a superstar. Mm. But yeah, in the prom of their career, I'm not so sure. Well, it is a little bit of a watch because... <laughs> and then is Toby Green the next captain? I was just about happened? to say that, yeah. I, just, I, I think he is. I think he is. I think he is. Yeah, I, I think yeah. I think it's one of those ones where you give him the captaincy, he grows up, and you'll see uh, he stops doing this, this silly stuff. Imagine if they hand him the captaincy, and round one he just goes bang and throws <laughs> a jab at Caleb Daniel or something <laughs> like that, like he has before. That would be that would be the, some of the biggest news you've ever seen in footy. Yeah, Toby Green captain round in the first six rounds suspended. Yeah, it would be. It would. Yeah, people would be going absolutely nuts. I, I, yeah, I probably do think Toby Green is the ca- uh, the next captain, and I think it probably happens next year. And Cornelio, well, it's um. Do you, do you, do you see the Giants on the rise or on the drop? On the rise. Because like, everyone had them on the drop. No, nah, I and reckon they they're thought, on the rise. Well, everyone had them on the drop going into the season, and when they had their poor start to the season, yeah. and then they started playing all these young players and make the top eight and look fucking mint for a big portion <laughs> of it. Um, yeah, so it's a tough one. I don't know if they're on the way. Because, when you, you know, when you go, you, when the teams that are on the precipice of the eight always go, right, which teams are going to be the ones that fall out of the eight? Mm. That gives us the opportunity to come in. I reckon, you know, I have no faith in Carlton whatsoever. But if I was a team, you know, on the precipice of the eight looking in, I think I'd be tipping GWS to be one of the teams that falls out. Uh, um, I, yeah, see, play. it's quite interesting because I see them finishing no – lower than sort of 10th next year um so it is i think it's going to be if this season was close and tight i think next season will be double that because i don't really see i think the teams that i thought could drop out like a west coast have so it's it's just going to be crazy um Moving on now to our preview of the prelim finals ahead. I'm sure. How 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 much have you thought about the prelim final coming up? Like, is it every half hour? Is it more often than that? Uh, it's probably more often than that. If I'm going to be honest, it has been an obsessive thought over the last three weeks. Um, wh- yeah. Once we beat the Cats, we played the Lions. It. Once we beat the Lions, it has been obsessive. Like, I can't stop thinking about the team. I can't stop thinking about if things go positively for us. I can't stop thinking about if things go negatively for uh, mm. for us. I'm playing so many scenarios. Like, I, I play scenarios where the Cats kick the first four and we got to work our way back into it. I've played scenarios where we kick the first six and I'm excited and the lid's off, and but then they get the next four and it's, you know, it's just, <laughs> I, I, I am obsessively thinking about it. It's crazy. Are you exhausted or are you energised? Is it, Are you there with every passing minute, you're getting more and more excited at the, at the obsessive thought? Are you there going, please, can we just let this be over? I'm sick of the torture of waiting. See, so well, Dad said today, Dad goes, I can't wait to get it over with. I'm soaking it in. We're, we're, yeah, we're never in a that's prelim. that's the way of going about it. We're, we're, yeah. you have to enjoy it. We're never in a prelim. Um, we never get this far in a season. We've never enjoyed this season like this before. It's the most successful home and away D season ever. And I just feel so privileged to be a part of it. So I'm soaking it in. I'm, I'm listening to every show. I'm tuning into every SEN podcast. I just, I'm soaking in just every part of it and I'm just so excited for this week and it's going to be crazy but um, (laughs) I'm pumped I'm pumped yeah well supporting the teams we've supported for so long it's been undeniable disappointment just no sign of hope whatsoever nearly Um, we're talking you know halfway through the season you already know you can't make finals or if you do Mm. make finals you're out early it's not often 
when you're supporting teams like us where you get genuine belief and a genuine hope and belief in a premiership. So yeah. I couldn't <laughs> couldn't be with you anymore. Soak in every second. But uh, we'll talk about the game now, the Demons and the Cats. How do you see the game unfolding? What do you? Where do you see the game being won and lost? And uh, who do you think will win and by how many points? Please do not say Geelong. I felt really, really crook throughout the week. I've seen some uh, some talk about the D's have one hand on the cup. The D's this, the D's that. Really jumping the gun. And there's no Melbourne supporter out there that will be thinking past this week. And if there are, they're, they've just jumped on in the last couple of months because... Every Melbourne supporter deep down is waiting for the cliff to arrive and us just to fall off it, to be honest. But we've just been so blessed and, um, yeah, blessed with how, how the team's performed this season that it is exciting going into it. I I, I have enough faith that they get it done, Roggie. I, I do. I, I don't know. Like, a part of me is wrestling with that, going, this is the Cats, McDonald. You've you've had you've had faith against the Cats over many, many moons and been absolutely embarrassed, hat in hand, scarf in the bin, walking out of GMHBA Stadium, going, what have I just witnessed? But the trust that I have in this group, I just feel like they are so hungry. Um, they really want to get it done. And to be sort of analytical about it, I can see it, a, and I'm, I'm more praying and hoping, but I... I can see a bit of a fast start by the D's, get a little bit of a gap, and then arm wrestle from there. And, and that's what I'm hoping for. I hope they start well, because if Geelong kick the first four, it's going to be tough to watch. <laughs> well, the way I see it, if um, <laughs> I think I see two scripts on the table in front of me. They're written by <laughs> Steven Spielberg. Um, I, I have a read over the first script, and it says... Uh, the old aren't done with yet. And you get a, you see Dangerfield and you see Selwood tearing the game apart and it's a reminder, this is why they are Geelong. This, mm. is, this is why they are champions. <laughs> this is why Dangerfield and Selwood are the players and have the reputation they have. You see Oliver and Petrarca getting overroared by the moment, overroared by the experience and the class and the mm. power. Uh, and, yeah, we go into the grand final with Geelong in there um, on account <laughs> of their veteran legends. Yeah. And then you have the other script, uh, and it's just titled The Passing of the Torch. You see yeah. Dangerfield and Selwood trying their hardest, but they just cannot keep up with Oliver Petrarca. They can't keep up with your midfield as hard as they try, and it is clear to see. Everyone's watching it going, ah, yep, this is a moment. This is a moment <laughs> where when you think about the best midfielders, as we've said so many times, your brain no longer goes to Dangerfield and Selwood. They're, they're in that other bracket. They're the, they're the has-been champions and still can play, but just not that elite bracket. And now when you think of the elite footballer, you straight away go to Petrarca. You straight away go to Oliver. And that's the script that I am going with as director of the movie that is the preliminary final. I think it's going to be blatantly obvious for everyone to see that Melbourne are the new Geelong. The sustained success. <laughs> is coming and this is the start of the Geelong decline. Jeez. I'm I just feel sick thinking about it if I'm going to be honest. I feel really really sick. And it's it's crazy because it's not like we've been done twice by Geelong this year and they've overall well they did overall or us for an 8 minute patch in the second quarter in the last round but it's I'm not intimidated by them anymore. So it's quite weird that I still feel this like reservation about backing the D's in fully. Considering we've climbed this hurdle twice this year, it's not like we've come off two losses against them and I'm going, how are we meant to beat them in a prelim? It's like we've beaten them twice, but it's just in my head I go, no, there's no chance we beat the Cats three times in a year, let alone in a preliminary final. Um, A part of the ground that I really want to take aim at is we know that Geelong's forward line is their potentially their best part of the ground, but our back line is potentially our best part of the ground as well. The part of the ground that I think is really interesting is the D's forward line versus Geelong's back line. And no Tom Stewart, uh, Lockie Henderson, a little bit iffy in that first uh, qualifying final. Uh, Collar Jasny can be a little bit hit and miss. The Blitz is amazing. Uh, Mark Blitz is, is amazing, but sometimes he has to go and help Ruck. I think there's a bit of a, a, bit of a sort of uh, thought that the Melbourne forward line isn't that good, but I, I I can see a sort of game how a Frida, a Cozzy, a Benny Brown can give Geelong's backline something to really think about. 
Yeah, well, I've said this before. I said it last week, so I won't go into it in depth again. The only reason why there are questions over your forward line is because your midfield and your back line is A++++. plus plus plus. If your midfield and your back line were a team just making the top eight, if it was a C plus or a B, there'd be no questions of your forward line because Ben Brown kicks goals every week. Cozzy Pickett kicks goals every week. Fritch kicks goals every week. It's not like we're looking there going, where are the goals going to come from? Yeah. You've got goals there. The goals are there to be seen. They, you kick them every week. So I'm not stand, I'm not one of the people that have question marks over your forward line, but I do acknowledge that it's not as strong as your midfield and your back line. And Ben Brown, I just I love the story of him leaving um, or getting thrown out of the wooden spooners and walking into the potential premiers and something deep down inside me. This is a genuine inkling I've had for a while. I think he comes out in that grand final and he <laughs> and he just goes back like he did against Essendon in that uh, qualifying final a few years back. I think he kicked eight or something like that. I just see Ben Brown coming out and going bang, 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 dead eye dick kicking four or five on the way to a D's flag. It is going to be an absolute – oh, it's going to be massive. Um, I don't know if they're going to sell it out, but I've handballed me finals code to Druzy, so he's going to be representing the Ds over at Optus Stadium. Oh, that's ripper. It is, yeah. It is going to be unbelievable. The Ds are in so a pre- – what's So your, what's your tip and how many points? Uh, I think it'll be tight. I think uh, tight as in like low scoring. I think it will be Cats 50, Ds – 85. I think the D's will get up by a cu- I think they'll be up by about three goals all game and then kick a couple of sealers towards the end. Low scoring, tight, hard contest, but the D's will just get over the line. Well, not just get over the line, but the, the cream will rise to the top and um, hopefully the D's will get it done. What about yourself? Yeah, I'm tipping a five goal win to the Demons. Uh, I think it'll be. Um, Demons up by a couple of goals all game, but not the couple of goals where you're thinking, gee, Geelong are going to win at any moment. Mm. I think it'll be the two goals where it's like Geelong just can't get that next goal. They might get one back and then you kick two, but they can't get those two on the trot or that three on the trot. Um, so I think they'll you'll be out of their reach for the whole game, just be that little bit classier. Then when it gets to the last quarter, you'll fire away in the last 10, 15 minutes and win by five or six goals. That's, that's my prediction. Oh, God. Moving on to the Port and the Dogs. Obviously, we probably don't have as much insight as we'd like to give in comparison <laughs> to when we're talking Demons. Uh, but what, what do you, how do you see this game playing out? Obviously, Port are the red-hot favourites to win, but the Doggies, they've done it before. They've made a grand final. Do you think they'll uh, repeat the fairy tale or a Port just that bit too good? Well, every time I talk about a Port Adelaide game or a Bulldogs game <laughs> in the last six weeks I get it completely wrong and I get hammered for it um, I think I tipped the Lions last week I think I said the Cats could beat Port by 10 goals in the qualifying final I, I, I'm just getting these teams completely wrong the whole time I don't have a gut feel with this one in particular Roger we know how good both these sides can be but I'm going to I'll probably tip I'm going to back in Port and I'm going to say by three goals I'm going to tip Port Adelaide just because with the injury cloud over one Marcus Bontempelli and with uh, uh, Waitman um, unfortunately going to be ruled out, it seems like, with the concussion. I hope he doesn't. I hope they find a loophole there because they didn't technically rule him out with the concussion. It was just a head knock. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I think with Waitman and, uh, you know, I probably saw Bontempelli, um, I think it'll probably be – and, you know, Tim English going up against the big Bruce, that is Scotty Lysette. <laughs> I probably see Port Adelaide just overpowering them and probably going on to win by uh, sort of two or three goals. I think it'll be be a close-ish game. But uh, I, I hope I hope I'm wrong, and I hope Baz Linker goes to work <laughs> because I would love to see. I'd love to see Melbourne Port Grand Final. I hate. I would hate to see Geelong in the Grand Final. I do not want them in there. I want Melbourne in the Grand Final, and I want them going up against. Um, the Bulldogs, because I think you both have that vibe about you of the young up and coming. Mm. I know in saying that, Port Adelaide do as well. There's my rosy butters. Whoever's in the grand final, I couldn't care so long as the D's <laughs> are in there, but I'm tipping Port by two or three goals. How good's footy? You, there are no losers here. Well, it's good that it's the top four as well. Uh, wait, no, yeah. it's not because lines are out, but it, it is the top. It, it's the best four sides, I think, throughout the season. 
Yeah, well, Bulldogs were premiership favourites a month or two ago, so mm. um, I, I'm with you there. Let's move on to our G's, the B's and the O's. I'll fire us off this week with my out on the full. We just touched on it, and it's the Waitman concussion. The, I'm so out on the full about this because <laughs> if it was just a blatant concussion, I'd be there going, I'm devastated, that is out on the full. But, uh, you it know, it's sense. understandable. Yeah. He's knocked out. You, it's unavoidable, yeah. really. Um, but the fact that there's a massive cloud, he was bouncing around after the game. It was like he was ready to go out there and play another game right then and there. Yeah. So it's almost like one of those ones where when you have the player miss a game because of COVID, but he's returned a COVID negative test, it just so happens he had to be at an exposure site. Yeah. With this one, it's like, wait a minute, he can play, he should play, but protocol says he'll miss. So I'm frustrated. He's one of my all-time favourite players outside of the football club. I love the way he goes about it. So that's why on the full. That's a great out in the full, Roger. Hopefully, Waitman can play and get up because he's one of the most exciting players that goes around at the minute. My out on the full uh, is just the GWS Geelong final. I just thought it was a little bit flat, a little bit uh, sort of was flat, sort of anticlimactic. It was just mistake after mistake, and one of the one of the weirder games I'd watched for the season, to be honest. It sort of had this like non-final feel for a chunk of a chunk yeah. of the game. So uh, it nearly put you to sleep. It nearly put me to sleep. And I yeah. feel it like... Felt like uh, I feel yeah, like the boring guess. final is probably behind us. I feel like these next few will sort of reach those uh, those expectations. I wouldn't speak too soon. If it's a Geelong Port Adelaide grand final, we know what's happened last time they <laughs> played. We'd be still nightmares haunting them from that. But my behind, uh, McDonald. Is Brisbane in straight sets, and the reason they're my behind is because I feel like it's stiff to give a team out in the fall when they've made the top four a couple of years mm. in a row. Um, but it's a massive watch this space. What happens next year if they don't make a grand final and they've made the top four again? It just reeks of good but not good enough. Um, and it, I feel sorry for Fags. I love Chris Fag, and I'd love to see Mitch Robinson in a grand final. But, yeah, you never want to see a team go out in straight sets, especially when you're playing, you know, a Bulldogs team with a few injuries and whatnot. So they should have won that game. They didn't, but I still think there are positive times ahead for the Lions. Uh, my behind, Roggie, is Ben King. Had a really good season, Ben King. Kicked 47 goals. I saw that uh, Took Miller won the Gold Coast Suns uh, BNF. And I looked down the list, and in the top 10, there was no Ben King. I couldn't see Ben King. You didn't make King. the top 10. No, he wasn't in the top 10, the top 10. of the Gold Coast Suns' best and fairest. I couldn't even name nine other Gold Coast players. I could, was Sean Lemons in there? I don't know. I, probably, I can get the list up for you, but it was just... It was really surprising. Ben King, I was looking for his name, genuinely looking for his name, and um, it just didn't pop up. And after 47 wow. goals uh, in the season, it was a real shock. 47 goals and he hasn't made the top 10. No. It, what the hell? Um, I'm okay. just, I'm just, you can go with your goal and I'll, I'll get the, the top I'll 10. I'll go up. with me goal. We talked about it already. My goal is the Bazlinka celebration. Um, I'll, it's my goal because it polarised so many people. I was also Skyping, but I was in a big Skype group call with a, a, probably a dozen of my mates there. And as soon as he's done that, half the crowd <laughs> went, that wanker, that's going to come back to bite him, wait until they lose this game. And he's done the ice in his vein celebration. And I went, no, this is what we need in the game. We need mm. more personality. We need more people to go out on a limb like that and add some character. It makes it so much more exciting, so much more to talk about. You know, you look in the Premier League and the NBA, the celebrations these players have, Charlie Cameron doing his Harley. I love the art of the goal celebration. Mm. Baz Lenka, that's probably the best one I've ever seen. Just, I love how quickly his brain identified that that was the right celebration. You know, it wasn't premeditated. He didn't think that he just kicked the goal and gone, I have fucking ice in my veins because I'm <laughs> Bailey Smith. So and he held it ha- for ages. He held it yeah. right in their face for yeah. ages. <laughs> yeah. Just staring right at them. I love, I don't think it's arrogance. I think when you're that good, you're allowed to do it. That's just. Being, that's just understanding the moment and um, and being confident. I rate that, Rog. Uh, the Gold Coast top 10 of the BNF was Took Miller, Will Powell, David Swallow, Sam Collins, Charlie Ballard, Brandon Ellis, Sean Lemons, Noah Anderson, Nick Holman, Jack Lacocious. That's your top 10. <laughs> Nick Holman. You're trying to tell me Ben King, 40, how many? 47 goals. 47 goals. Nick. Nick Holman, delisted from Carlton, runs around a little small forward. How many goals did he kick? You're trying to tell me he had a better year than Ben King. <laughs> They've just signed their own death warrant when he requests a trade back to St Gilda. Yes, it is. Um, yeah, unbelievable. I, it was a, a shock omission, I would have thought. 
Absolutely. Give us your goal, your six-pointer. My six-pointer uh, in our prelim final podcast, my six-pointer is the when, – when the Brisbane Lions lost on the weekend, there was a lot of shattered fans, shattered players out on the ground. Uh, video has uh, come out from the stands, and it's Cam Rayner consoling Reese Matheson. He is bawling his eyes out in the in the stands, absolutely gutted that the Lions couldn't get up in their semi final, and it's a it's a goal to Cam Rayner. The way he consoles him is very very uh, respectable. He's he just looks like a great big brother and, and a great teammate. Uh, Cam Rayner, but also it's a goal to Reese Matheson. I've seen um, him in interviews before, really express his his passion and love for the Brisbane Lions. He's expressed that he's not going anywhere. He's got a house up there. He's, he's from Geelong, but he's got a house up there. Um, when he had his debut, he made a speech in front of the whole group saying, look, I know we're in hell at the minute, but I want to help you know drag us out of out of here you know I've been drafted here to help make some change and it's quite funny because he he is a needful player he, uh, uh, he, he does play in the seconds he, he does be the um, the the medical substitute but he will do anything for that side and his passion is very very uh, commendable I think so fair play to Reese Matheson for expressing his emotions and his passion towards the club and fair play to Cam Rayner for um, looking after his teammate. Oh, that's a great one. And especially with Matho, he cops a lot of heat from me as well. He's probably one of my more maligned players in the competition. Something about him just screams, oh, you are very annoying, Reese Matheson. <laughs> but uh, to see that passion, um, that's what we need more of. And, you know, uh, I, I reckon he's crying there because he, the team he loves is lost. And I reckon he's probably crying a bit because he feels like he could have uh, yeah. helped win them the game if he had been in there. So yeah. love that goal. One of the best for the season, I reckon. Uh, that's it for another episode of the Battle. Back pocket plug out podcast, Roggy. Really exciting week, prelim final week. It doesn't get much <laughs> better than time, this. <laughs> mate, when we hit the microphones next week, oh, no. when our next podcast rolls around, <laughs> we'll hopefully be talking about the Melbourne oh. Demons, <laughs> formerly the most pathetic side in the competition for a decade. We could be talking about oh. them in a grand final. Soak in this week. Get excited. Oh. I cannot wait to be chatting to you again next week. And it will be a tough pod if we're not. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, there will be no pod if we're not. That's the end of the back pocket plugger. Absolutely. Um, that's it from us. Uh, we appreciate everyone who tuned in on Spotify and iTunes. We appreciate everyone who's watched on YouTube. And we'll see you next week for some more back pocket plugger podcastery. Keep plugging those back pockets.